Thank you. And uh, you know, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Superb. Um, well, I'm going to begin by saying I'm always happy to be in the Valley. I've had a connection here and at UMass and, 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 and with MTA for a long, long time, uh, 40 years in one way or another. Uh, my son went to college in the Valley. Um, but I've had a lot of friends and faculty here, former students on faculty here and, uh, and active in the union. But even more, more, more than that, like I've been a huge fan of the MTA for a long, long time because it's a fighting union and, and, and a union that has fought vigorously for the public sector and doesn't fight a battle and, and go away, right? I mean, I remember, for instance, uh, I'm pretty sure the MTA, at least the MSP, was, uh, well, was a crucial member of a coalition in 2000 that uh, fronted two non-binding non ballot initiatives at, in eight or nine cities around the state, Commonwealth, one for single-payer health care and the other for the end of the MCAS. That sound familiar? Right? So um, here we are, 23 years later, still, still fighting for the end of the MCAS, but that's the way it goes. I mean, how long did it take for the graduate employees and students organization at Yale to get recognition. That was more like 30 years. So if, and we may not always win when we fight. It may take a long time to win. We, we may not win at all. But the one thing is for damn sure is that if we don't fight, we're never going to win. Right? <laughs> so that said, um, I'm going to start out uh, with pointing to, to some bad news and some good news. And my personality being the way it is, like I would have asked you first, but my personality preempts because I'm up here. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to begin with the bad news, right? Uh, because I think it's good to approach stuff like the way they teach kids in a little league to play the outfield, where, where you go to the wall first on a deep fly ball and then we'll work your way back in. So it helps to imagine the worst possible thing that could happen and then go from there. So the bad news is, uh, and I think the marquee, and I'll put to one side stuff like climate change, but, and it's not that I'm trivializing it, but I think part of our problem is, and we can maybe talk about this in, in, the, group discussion, in the group discussion segment, that we've been sold a bill of goods about how we can fight climate change without taking on corporate capitalism. <laughs> and it's not possible. So... Uh, but I noticed today, like I'm going up to t Toronto well, in a couple of months, and, 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 and when I per booked my itinerary today on Air Canada, I noticed that there was a link where I could uh, add a contribution to, to, to offset uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so, so I thought, ain't that some shit, right? So they got me. <laughs> That they want me to subsidize them. Anyway, all right. Uh, and as anyone who has ever taken a class, class with me knows, that's probably going to be the first of a, several digressions in this talk. Um, but politically, th this is the most dangerous and frightening time in this country in my lifetime. And, and I'm 76 years old, 76 and a half, even. Uh, we're a hair's breadth away from complete GOP control of all three branches of government, and it's not even like Reaganite control. Uh, and because if that were to happen here, uh, then that would very likely be the end of American democracy for, as we've known it, such, a, such as it is, for the foreseeable future. The wing of the GOP that's in control has made clear its intention to roll back the last century of social protection uh, and, and, and advances toward, 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 toward equality and social justice that, that, that we've won uh, painstakingly. And now that they have control of the federal judiciary and we see the way that they operate, what, I mean, the combination of, of corruption and insanity, um, that, that drives them, uh, there'll be nothing that would hold back their agenda, right? I mean, I wrote a piece not that long ago, a little while ago, um, that examined the ways that, um, that 
judicial rhetoric or legalistic rhetoric has a, has a legitimized uh, backward, anti-popular, racist, sexist um, law right over the course of of of, of the history of the history of the republic, just by making shit up as they go along, right? But through formalist claims, and and I'm thinking about stuff like the Dred Scott decision in 1857, Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, the Lochner era cases, um, and the notions of like strict constructionism that emerged out of the struggle against. Uh, um, the Brown decision, basically, in the South after 1954. Um, that, and, and by the way, some of you may recall, some of the other Alta Cockers in here may recall um, Senator Sam Irvin, who became a folk hero during the Watergate investigation because, he, uh, because of the reputation that he had as being a constitutional specialist, which was a reputation, I screamed at the television every time I saw this, because his a reputation was forged as playing the well, one of the good cop roles in, 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 in the Southern Segregationist program of massive resistance right after the Brown decision. Uh, you know, the bad cops were, were some, some of the ones you know, like George Wallace and James Eastland or whatever. The good cops were, were the ones who said, well, it's not that we we're opposed to desegregation per se, but we're just concerned about the sanctity of the Constitution, right? Uh, so there was that, and now we've seen one or another bogus ideology that's been generated by the Federalist Society since it was founded in 1981 or 1982, with the most recent one being, uh, what are they calling this one now? Um, the, oh, yeah, the Major Questions Doctrine. Uh, that, that they made it up, right? I mean, they made this up in, in the same way that my son, when he was four years old, made up that he was either um, speed racer or ultraman, right? <laughs> uh, but, but they made it up out of, whole, whole, uh, no, uh, out of whole cloth. And the substance of this ruling is that, um, con or the Constitution doesn't permit e executive agencies to act independent of the legislature on what they call major questions. And it's pure crap, but, but on, but the reason I'm going on about that is that we, we will see more and more of that coming. And if, and, and if the Republicans get control of both houses of Congress and the White House, uh, then there'll be nothing to hold it back. Um, so I've probably been, in fact, I know I've been saying for a while now that the global march of fascist and authoritarian governments and, and movements suggests that the neoliberal regime that we've been living under, at least since the 1990s, and maybe we, we, we can discuss the key pertinent features of that regime in our discussion segment also, but, but, but for now, I'll just say that for me, the main characteristics of it are, are a rigorous program or, or a, an aggressive program of upward re redistribution and and, and what it comes down to is what capitalism looks like if there's no working class opposition. Uh, <clears throat> so whenever you think about ne neoliberalism, just think about 1920 here. Um, but, but things may have come to a pass in the aftermath of the Great Recession that ne neoliberal regimes are no longer able to deliver enough benefits to enough of the population to maintain its legitimacy as a nominally democratic order. And I've kind of built on that observation or contention to, to invoke uh, you know, the metaphor of a T intersection, right? You come up to the T intersection, there's only two ways you can go, and the directions are diametrically opposed, right? You can either go in the direction here of fascism or some other flavor of authoritarianism that preserves markets and, and, and disciplines the rest of us. That's what that stuff is all about anyway. Or go, go in the opposite direction, which is, which is the direction uh, away from how uh, American society, government, political economy have been moving for the last 40 years. Uh, so what that means is like, uh, you know, that direction, I just happened 
to put it on my left, is a direction that, that among other things, calls for us like, to revisit some earlier moments in, in American political history where, where the possibilities were, were a little clearer, broader, and the contestation was a greater. And I'll get to that in a second, too. Um, So it's necessary, I think, to consider how these dangerous forces have made such, such, such headway, right, like over the last decades. And this is, yet again, I'm putting a lot on our agenda for discussion, so I better not talk too long. Um, but uh, like this is another topic for, for our group, group discussion, perhaps. Uh, but for now, I'll, I will offer a tease that this moment is the culmination of a decades-long agitation by uh, well-funded, you know, anti-worker, inegalitarian interests uh, aimed at trying to roll, uh, it, and that is at least going back to Barry Goldwater, but actually a lot longer than that. Uh, but, but, but they're concerned to roll back everything working people and advocates of social justice and equality have won since the 1930s. And, like, I mean, it's interesting. I remember not long after the Republicans took over Congress in the middle of the Clinton administration, and I just happened to be watching a press conference with a bunch of them on C-SPAN. Some names that won't 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 mean anything to most of you. Some some names that that might mean something, but you wish I hadn't brought up. But people like Tom Delay, Dick Armey, Newt Newt Gingrich, Bob Livingston, and what struck me, uh, it, it really brought me up short, like in a literal way, because. That one after another, Syriatum, they were sneering about how their their objective was to take the United States back to the 1920s, and and of course I know what what what, what before the 1920s means, right? And we all do. Um, what I, I I assume, um, and it wasn't like a musical, <laughs> right? Unless maybe a musical was Springtime for Hitler, but. Uh, <laughs> But, um, and I thought then, then, uh, then I can still recall a sensation. I thought, God, you know, one problem with Americans' approach to cultural history is that we tend to think about the relation between past and present, like in terms of fashion changes, right? So, you know, 60s, afros, long hair, bell bottoms, whatever. Uh, that fascism, leather, chrome, sleek, Slick back hair, Teutonic one of style efficiency, and what gets lost is that the rank and file leadership of of the Nazi Party, the National Social Democratic German Workers Party, what they call themselves, or National Socialist German Workers Party is what they call themselves, were like second-rate academics and 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 often enough first-rate academics. Right? I mean, Martin Heidegger was not from nothing. Um, and um, haberdashers and small businessmen and lawyers with crackpot ideas and, 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 and doctors joined by this combination of really ugly disposition and crack, crackpot ideas. And I looked at these guys and thought, oh, oh my God, that's who's running Congress. And like that was 1994. Uh, so I mean, here we go. Um, but they're out to destroy, and this is clearer with every moment, they're out to destroy public goods, as and MTA members know all too well, public education, um, but all other public goods. And the point of this objective, well, I, I, I mean, they're an alliance too. So some parts of this alliance want to get rid of public, public goods across the board because they want Jesus to provide for, for, well, I mean, their version of Jesus, right? To provide what we think of as education, what we think of as healthcare, what we think of as housing, what we think of as everything else. Um, and um, you know, even there, there's scams, but that's another story. Um, some of them won't want to marketize uh, the, you know, the entire world, right? And like this is, Frightening at a quotidian level. Like I've seen, what well, I've seen reports. I'm sure a lot of you have have also, in the last month or two, about private equity having discovered hospice care. 
And that's almost as frightening um, you know, a sentence to utter as, Lauren Boebert has a gun. Uh, <laughs> but, so, but others, and these overlap, right? I mean, that's, and maybe I'll say something about uh, how to think about the difference uh, between a coalition and, and an alliance in a second. But those different motives overlap, and, and they get to the point where once they function as an alliance, each component of them is, is just as committed to the other components' agendas as they are to their own, because they understand that their allies getting what they want is a crucial condition for them be, being able to get what they want. That's something our side, that's, some, that's um, a moral. I think our side has forgotten often enough. We'll come back to talk about that. Um, but, but, but the other piece of the other side's objective is um, to make, to strip all of us as working people of, of whatever options we might have other than to accept work on whatever terms employers want to offer. And when you think about it, like, you know, when we talk about social wage policy, that's what social wage policy going back to meatpacking, right, has, has, has largely been about, right, and, and, uh, and not to say labor legislation, right, civil rights law, right, that's all about expanding uh, the autonomy of all of us as members of the polity. Uh, but this right-wing tidal wave coming at us wants to destroy all, all of that for all of us. And I think that's a good perspective to maintain on it as we go forward, too. So, that, for instance, um, the concerted attack on, on affirmative action that just got passed the Supreme Court, just like, uh, just like um, the rabid anti-abortion, sorry, anti-reproductive freedom politics uh, that, that, that we've seen being hammered on right over and over and over for, for the last decades, are what they are, and they're hideous for what they are. Right? There's no question about that. But it's important for us to keep in mind that there are also elements of a larger agenda that wants to strip all of us of any options that we have except to go to work on whatever conditions em employers want to offer it. And in this regard, it's kind of interesting, too, noticing or to notice that in the last months, right, all of a sudden, um, you know, Republicans in various states around the country have gotten all worked up about child labor laws, right? You probably noticed this, but it's like, wow, I mean, really? They're going for that already? I thought they'd at least win until they got that, but it's not like they need them really yet. I mean, but, uh, uh, all right, anyway. But, alas, I digress. Um, so this is the fight that faces us. And the odds are against us because the other side has advantages of resources um, and, and among those resources, by the way, is the goodwill of the mainstream media, which we sometimes forget is like more accurately known as the corporate media, <laughs> right? Uh, which, which means that our side doesn't, can't really expect to get a fair hearing, right? Not even from MSNBC, right? Um, but that, uh, and, and the political system has been stacked, rigged, right, over decades to privilege, and I hate using a noun as a verb, but excuse me, uh, you know, the interests of the wealthy and powerful. And see, this is where a little bit of that line coming, so, so, I, so I drove down here from Portland, Maine, I mean, yesterday, and I was supposed to have Sirius in a rental car, but it didn't work, which, which meant that I got to listen to what I would hear if I were driving through South Carolina. But, um, but so that meant I got a bunch of right-wing talk, talk radio, a couple of Catholic right-wing stations, which is kind of weird. But, um, but what struck me there was that, uh, it, it, well, in fact, the first station I got was the Glenn Beck show, and I didn't even know it was Glenn, 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 you know, Glenn Beck until it was over. But the way he was going on about how um, they, 
are trying to, to take away our ability to vacation to Europe. Okay, I thought, okay, this is kind of a funny thing to be concerned about. But, but it's all about um, the rigged financial system. Uh, uh, he didn't mention the Rothschilds, but Soros made a cameo. And, but, 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 uh, but my point with this is that part of what appeals to ordinary people, right, about the right or, or the fascist message, right, I'll just call it dog bites right now, is that it connects with truths or realities that people actually feel, um, but that our side, whatever our side is, hasn't effectively been able to, to equip them with understanding and responding to. Um, you know, for those of us who are in and around a labor movement, like the one, one of the main political objectives for all of us, I think, is trying to find, find ways to, to maintain conversations like that, not only within our own unions, but, but, but with other working people too, uh, to try to turn that around. And I mean, no, like you don't win people back from fascism, right? I, well, I can understand why you might want to try it if it's a relative or whatever. But you, but you get a bigger bang for the buck by trying to get to people before they get drawn into, into the orbit of conspiracy thinking. Because you know, one of the things about conspiracy theory is that the absence of evidence is, is only proof of the depth of the conspiracy. So, so you can't get them out of it. And, and, and I, I kind of know how that goes. I was raised Catholic. But, um, <laughs> And I say that because I know I'm not alone here. But, um, <laughs> but it's also the fight of all of our lifetimes. Because if we can't keep them at bay, and that begins with 2024, and even if what that means is another two years or four years of, of the Biden administration kicking the reckoning down or, or, or the can of the reckoning down the road, that, that's all we have to... to, to to, to achieve at this point, really. Um, but if we can't keep them at bay in 2024 and beyond, then we are likely to lose everything that we've won in the last century or, or more. And I know the way this goes. So much, and especially you know, for people who aren't old enough to have like a dim connection to the bad old times, uh, so, so much of what we've won just feels like nature now that we can't imagine it being, being lost. Um, but trust me, it, it'll be a whole different and, 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 and a much uglier world. Now, the pivot, the good news. <laughs> this part isn't exactly what I'm known for, but I mean, you know. Uh, but, but the MTA has, has shown that it's possible to fight and to win and how to do it, right? And, and it's not just, and, and what's so great about the position of public sector unions in particular is that teachers, nurses, um, God, I almost said lawyers, wait, <laughs> sorry. Teachers, nurses, firefighters, sanitation workers, right, et, et, et cetera, in pursuing their own interests uh, or the interests of their members, right, are simultaneously pursuing the public good, right? And, it's, and, and it took a while for many public sector unions to realize that that's an important point to make outside the ranks of the union. But uh, well, the nurses in California did it when they and the firefighters single-handedly turned back Governor Schwarzenegger's attempt to, to gut the public pension pro programs. And other units have done it since. And MTA, and I'm not just saying this because I'm here, but, but the MTA has really been on the forefront for like 20 years of trying to take this fight. I mean, when, when we first started um, you know, to try to organize around um, a, a campaign for free public higher education in 2000, but the MTA was one of the first unions to get on board. Uh, and then when we try to do it again, 
uh, around 2007, eight, the MTA was right there again, right? Because people understand that, and, and there's nothing wrong about being in a position where your ability to maintain your, your own livelihood is, is dependent on fighting for the public good, right? I mean, some people think of that as, you know, you know, not being moral, but that's the best way to do it, right? Because you know that what's good for the public is good for you too, so it's great. Anyway, um, and, and I mean, nothing more clearly e exemplifies what fighting for a long time, losing, learning, continuing to fight, and, and, and winning can be, and what the promise of that can be, than the fair share amendment, right? That you guys won. So, I just, so, so, so I'm going to give you all a hand. But now that I'm here, so when we can get beyond, and this is something else that 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 the MTA's approach to campaigning ha, ha, has shown, particularly with the ballot initiatives as opposed to partisan elections, because when we can get beyond knee-jerk reactions that both Democrats and and Republicans have cultivated, and address working people's felt needs and concerns directly, income, job, job quality and security, access to quality housing, education, healthcare environment, and, and, and so forth, we can win on an agenda that focuses on our needs, even in a context in which partisan polarization seems so strong, and, and in places where a liberal Democrat couldn't win um, the hot dog eating contest. I don't know. Right? So the key to winning the victories that the MTA has, has won, as, as well as to winning more, and the key to defeating the fascist challenge, is cultivating and sustaining broad solidarity. The understanding that, that, that what unites us as working people it is not only more important than what divides us, but, but that what unites us is the basis for trying to resolve what, what seems to divide us. And, and also, in a way, I think we talk about this too. Like, I want to stress what I mean by working people and the working class and maybe juxtapose it to this fiction called the middle class. Maybe we can discuss that in Q&A for a minute too. Um, solidarity is the key, and it also points to how the dangerous right has been able to succeed. Un until the late 60s and, and uh, the early 70s, for more than a generation, struggles for racial and gender justice linked directly to struggles for economic inequality. Um, but beginning in the 70s and 80s, liberals in increasingly accommodated corporate and employers' attacks on social wage policies by separating race, race and gender from, 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 from uh, working class politics, right? Uh, for, for, for example, um, again, some Alta Cockers might be able to recall this moment too, uh, but uh, the women's movement, uh, uh, I think well into the 1980s, was, was, was what featured a central focus on comparable worth in, in employment, and, and in the Yale strike in 84 had a lot to do with that too. Um, but, but also on issues like, you, like your universal publicly funded child and elder care. Somewhere between the formation of the Democratic Leadership Council and the, and, and, and of the nomination of Bill Clinton, uh, you know, that kind of item dropped, dropped out of the official agenda of, of the women's movement completely, which left us with a symbolic commitment to abortion rights. And I say symbolic because, among other reasons, like the smart public opinion poll-driven approach from, from the liberal Democrats was, don't call it abortion rights, call it right to choose, right? Which, like, they assumed that resonate with, with a kind of neoliberal sensibility in the first place, but like leaves, leaves the, fundamental, uh, the fund fundamental question of re reproductive justice off, right, off the table. 
Um, what one of many compromises in the last 70 years has come home to roost on us. Um, up through the civil rights victories of the mid-1960s, black activists and, and, and racial advocates saw the struggle for full employment as in inseparable from the struggle for black, black economic equality. And, and, and were therefore also committed to not just trade, trade unionism, but to the CIO model of, of trade unionism as, as a necessary condition for, for, for advancement of what would have been called the black political agenda. <clears throat> And one reason for that conviction was that those activists who were people on, on the ground um, working on a daily basis um, felt, were convinced that the only way to win victories for, for black people and to secure them once they were won was to win them from every, uh, for everyone, right? Um, so for instance, uh, Paulie Murray, what, I mean, a lawyer and, and an activist who has since become something of a cause celeb among some sections of the women's movement. In, in a 1945 law, uh, law Review article in, in, in uh, the California Law Review, I mean, actually argued that the full employment bill, which was st still in play in Congress, was more important for advancing black Americans' concerns with employment justice than anti-discrimination was, right, right at that moment. And I know it may sound weird, but, but true. And people like A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, MLK, Murray, all understood the basic reality, the basic trade union principle, right, that, um, that, that, that an injury to one is, is an injury to all, and the reciprocal being the, uh, well, uh, uh, the best way for me to improve my conditions is to improve everyone's conditions. Um, Randolph and said, uh, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, in fact, said in uh, 1966, in uh, introducing um, the, the freedom budget for all Americans that, you know, that was developed by him, Randolph, um, Leon Kaiserling, <clears throat> and... Uh, and, and, and uh, the Afield Randolph Institution. Uh, and I'll quote him briefly. While most Negroes live in poverty, it's not true that most of the poor are Negroes. We must not forget that 75% of the poor are white. No less than the Negroes are, are, they denied, are they denied adequate income, decent housing, quality education, health care, and Security, end quote. So, in the 19, so on what happened? Well, I mean, in the 1970s, really earlier, you know, I've been saying lately that the Kennedy administration was when the zygote of, ne of ne neoliberalism was formed. Racial justice became increasingly disconnected from, from the ideal of economic inequality. And as Preston Smith from Mount Holyoke College has, has, has contended the principle of racial democracy, which, uh, which, which basically amounts to a, a radical equality of opportunity, came to supplant the principle of social democracy as the core commitments in, in, in what came to be understood as black politics. And there are reasons for that we can discuss. In fact, I can, yeah, I can sit and talk about those reasons until I have to get on a plane at Hartford tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But that, that, that dynamism right, right, became linked um, to what, we, what would become uh, what been understood as ne neoliberalism. And that um, development is what over time yielded uh, the notion that racial disparity is the main standard for social justice, right? But what pe and the key problem, though, is that people didn't really notice for a long time, and are maybe only starting to come to notice now as, as as the relation becomes more and more blatant. 
that, um, that the anti-disparitarian focus um, or agenda becomes an increasingly class-skewed agenda, right? One that leaves most working class black and brown and other people out of it, right? So, so I mean, therefore, the racial justice agenda right, right, becomes more, comes, comes more to focus on narrowing gaps between rich, peel, rich people of color and, 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 uh, and uh, rich women of well, whatever colors and rich white, white men as the gold standard of rich, I guess. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and that, I would argue, is like the exact opposite of pursuing solidarity, right? Um, it's, it's, and, and it takes the form of, of presenting what's essentially a class-based program as one that's a race-based program that, that, uh, that will benefit all co-ethnics. Co but, but as I said in an article that, that, or a column that just came out a couple of days ago, that, that uh, when you get down to it, that Kamala Harris is vice president does very little for black women not named Kamala Harris, right? Uh, uh, but this is but like this is another way that that that, uh, that we've become accustomed to thinking because there's been no effective opposition raising counter voices and and when I've talked when I've talked to other union groups like you you, you can see that once people hear it like like uh, yeah, or, or the alternative view, like light bulbs, st start to go off. Um, uh, the focus on disparity is problematic in in other ways that we can talk about as well. Uh, among other things, it it provides space for fascist agitators to stoke r racial resentments with blacks get all the benefits rhetoric, but. But more pertinent, or more important than that, it, it also leads to an, 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 an agenda that doesn't address necessarily even inequalities that appear as racial disparities. For instance, wealth gap. Um, raise, uh, raise hands if you knew this, I'm just curious. Uh, but how many people know that 75% of so-called black wealth, and, and I put an asterisk next to that because I want to say something about that in a minute too. 75% of so-called black wealth is controlled by the 10% 10, 10 of the richest black, or the richest 10% of black people. And the 75% of so-called white wealth is controlled by the richest 10% of white people. So, and that the bottom 50%, I'm trying to stay in my lines, of, of, of blacks and whites have basically the same amount of wealth, which is zero. So whose program is closing the racial wealth gap, right? It's not a working people's program, certainly. Um, but there are a lot of other problems what I mean, like that too. I've also written about um, but with the racial health gap, right? Because it turns out that what, what, once you start to decompose the numbers, and, what, and one thing I've written about is uh, uh, the COVID crisis, that what appears to be racial differences turn out to be class differences, like what kind of work you do, where you, you live, what, what kind of housing you live in, and so forth and so on. So, so from that perspective, focusing on the race target kind of misses um, the kind of interventions that would actually be a benefit to, to, to most people of color. So finally, I think I've talked enough, but let me just say a couple of things, right, just to clarify. Something. Um, one is that I'm not calling for not attacking racism. Right? Sometimes, just, just because of the way we're accustomed to hearing, um, and you know, I know that, that like this could sound to some people like heresy or like apostasy. And, and as I said before, I'm, you know, um, I was raised Catholic, so I'm, so I'm sympathetic. But, <laughs> but. Um, but it's not. And I mean, I hate to do this kind of thing, although um, a colleague and comrade here like, suggested I do it. Uh, so, you know, young, smart, I mean, left-wing people yell at me enough when I say something like this. 
in, in fact, um, a faction of the DSA chapter in New York City uh, basically canceled um, a discussion that, that um, a colleague of mine were s scheduled to lead, uh, cautioning about the racial disparity line about COVID, actually. Um, but the fact is, um, yeah, I'm not naive about the existence of racism. I was largely, well, hell, I'm 67, and, well, I'm 76 and a half years old, so how could I have slept it? But, but I was largely raised in a Jim Crow South in the middle of it. And I remember a couple of scholars, um, when, when writing after uh, Hurricane Katrina, and most of my family's in New Orleans, uh, but I mean, they responded to my contention that a simple racism, anti-racism line wasn't adequate to understanding the travesty of Katrina. And, and both these jerk-offs, actually, excuse me for that, <laughs> um, said that my problem was that you know, I didn't understand the depth and intensity of, of racism in New Orleans, for God's sake, where, like, every day I rode home from school past the Orleans Parish Courthouse, on, you know, on which was emblazoned um, uh, the foundation, uh, uh, no, um, the, uh, the, the, fair, uh, the just administration, uh, uh, see, I'm blocking right now. Um, the equal administration of justice is, is the foundation of liberty. And, and every day for four years, I went to spit at it. But, but one of the problems with, with that kind of simplistic um, partisan thinking is that if you're not uh, um, mouthing the cant, then, th th then you must not understand racism. Uh, but I can assure you that I do. Or I can assure everyone out there who, uh, if anyone out there is inclined to think that's what my problem is, I probably have a lot of problems, but that's really not, not, not one of them. <laughs> but I will conclude with this, though, final point. This is kind of thought exercise, or if that really an exercise. But um, a couple of years before I retired, uh, I, I taught um, a black American political thought course. Uh, that was a really heavy reading course. And, uh, and, and it was a grad seminar. Uh, and one of the students, who's a first year student, who um, whose father is actually a member of the MTA at UMass Boston, um, was a leading discussion on, on, on a week's readings, uh, the, a mass of readings from 1935 to 1945, roughly. And she observed that one thing that struck her about these, the, these readings, and they were like, you know, Ralph Bunch, Randolph, or all kinds of people of that sort, was that no one called for fighting racism. You know, everybody talked about fighting for some programmatic um, ideas and, and, and against some, but that nobody called for waging a struggle against an abstraction called racism. And one of the problems with the struggle against racism is that it's not unlike the struggle against terrorism, right? I mean, it's an abstraction. You, you, you can't win it. You, you, you can't even define markers of victory, right? Uh, and in that sense, it's like a, um, a breeder reactor, right? It's a struggle that keeps itself going, and it's not really connected to us trying to win a better world. And, and on that provocation, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>